So first of all, just uh, put him Mechbod uh, Just want to thank uh, the SCA and uh, all the sponsors for uh, making it possible. And really, Tisha B'Av has become uh, just, while it's a ter terribly sad day, it's really just a chance to get to see how everybody comes together and really knows how to spend uh, the day in the appropriate manner. So it's really a kol uh, to everybody uh, involved. So you have a source sheet in front of you whose title is The Spies and Tisha B'Av. And we know a lot about the story of the Miragelim. And we're going to sort of challenge that story a little bit today, but mostly we're going to find out what the connection is between the spies, the Miragelim, and Tisha B'Av. And a lot of us may think that we know what the connection is, but it's really a, an extremely hidden message, and it really doesn't jump out at us at first glance. So to first to set this up, we're going to analyze the story of the Miraglim. So if you look at sources one and two, which is where we're going to be hanging out, also don't get intimidated by the source sheet. I'm going to explain everything, and you don't need to be paying attention in the sources the entire time. I know the uh, hunger slash thirst headache is starting to set in. And it's tough to look at a tough to look at a source sheet. But nevertheless, I'm going to read it. It has the English on the left hand side. And the first thing that I want to point out is that there are many differences between the two times that the Torah mentions the story of the Miragelim. The first time is in Bemidbar. And in that perasha, perashat Shelach, we see a story that is painted in a very different light when Moshe Rabbeinu repeats the story again in Devarim. Let's take a quick look at source one, Vaydaber Adonai Moshe Lemor. Hashem talks to Moshe and says the following, Shelach lecha anashim v'yaturu et eretz kena anasher ani noten de bnei Yisrael. Send for yourself people, anashim, vayaturu, to go and, really the English translation here is one of the best that I've found, to scout the land. Has nothing to do necessarily with anything military. And it's really just trying to take a look at what's going on. And the highlight is also on the land. It's on the aretz. Okay. And if we look at the story also in Bemidbar, we all know what happens. After B'nai Israel, they decide, okay, Hashem told us to go send these spies. They come back, they report on the land. And we know that there's a divide between the ten spies and the two good spies, quote unquote, right? Kaleb and Pinehas. And and what do we know that he gets a reward later? And what happens? We know that there's a tremendous reward, but there's also a punishment for B'nai Israel. And there's a day of crying. Look at source number two. And this, is, this day is going to be the line and the day that's in question. B'nai Israel, they raise their voices and they cry out. They cry out. And these cries are just left. It says, okay, they cry out, period. Now, where do we see that this has any connection to Tisha B'Av? We're going to get to later. But first, let's analyze some of the differences between the two stories. What's difference number one? We need to turn to source number three. If you turn the page over, source number three in Devarim starts. So that's the first difference. First difference is in the Bemidbar story, who initiates? Hashem. Hashem tells Moshe, send these people. In the second story, what happens? The people came in front of Moshe slash Hashem and they said, 
Listen, we think it's a good idea to do this. Guess what? You know what we should do? We should go and spy out the land. It's not vayaturu anymore. What word is used? Vayachperu. Vayachperu lachpor. What does lachpor mean? To dig. To unearth that which is hidden. So in the first story, we see Hashem talking to Moshe. And it's just very casual. It's walking from one end of the land to the next. In the second story, we see, no, the people are the ones who initiate. And it has the connotation of spying. What's another difference? Stick, skip down to Pasuk Kaf Gimel that I bolded. Bayitav be'inai hadavar. Who's talking here? Moshe. Moshe says in Devarim, and you know what? I thought it was a good idea. When we read the story in Bemidbar, does he think it's a good idea? No, absolutely not. And not only that, the nation breaks into cries. So Moshe is sort of almost in the Devarim story confessing, look, I also thought that this was a great idea. And he's taking ownership. He's taking ownership of what B'nai Israel asked for. And if we read on further in this source, we'll see that in Devarim, there's no difference between the ten good spies and the two Sadiqim of Kalev and Yehoshua. That in the first story, we know that Kalev and Yehoshua, they have to step up, they have to say, this is what we're doing, this is, no, we can conquer it, we're able to. In Devarim, it's all 12 are great. The report comes back as parv. But who perverted that? The Anashim, the nation. The nation, they were the ones who took that report and made it into something negative. So here we have two different lenses in which to view the story of the Meragelim. We're going to hold those two stories, two versions of the story, albeit the same source, being the Torah, and we're going to see how we're going to come back to it and how we're going to connect it to what we're going to say at the end. So where does it come from that this night is Tisha B'Av? When we looked in the Pesukim, we know very little about the time frame as to when the Meraglim were sent. Let's give a little bit of background of that. B'nai Israel leave Mitzrayim around Pesach time. They leave Pesach time in the first Shana. We wait a whole year, almost by Har Sinai, and a lot of events happen. We know we have Chet Egel. We know that around the beginning of the second year, we have the events of, of Memeriva. We also have all of the things that happen in Parashat Ha'alot Echa. And then, so this story happens in the second year, towards the summer months. And the Torah gives no context except for, and it's very funny because this is what the Meraglim end up coming into Eretz Yisrael and bringing with them. It's the time of the grape growth. The only time we see that we, that's given, we don't, we're not given a date, we're not given a, a, a time, we're only given an agricultural marker. This is the time when the grapes grew. Why is that significant? Everybody knows that. What did the Meraglim come and take back with them? Right? You always, we always know the picture of the car of the tour guides of Israel. Right? We see that the bunch of grapes, and they were brought back on massive poles because the grapes were just huge. So the Rabbanim, they want to say that, look, this probably means that the grapes were really in full bloom and it was really just an abnormal crop and the nation took it as, wow, look, you see how large these grapes are? They must be these mythical creatures of tremendous size that we're never going to be able to conquer and that's what leads to their negative report. So the grapes are not necessarily left there by the Torah as a precursor to tell you the timing per se, but they are left there to tell you that maybe this was the reason why the people got scared. But we still have no date. 
We don't know. Let's take a look at source four, and we'll start to see that the development of this becoming Tisha Be'av starts in the Mishnah. There's a Mishnah in Masechet Ta'anit. So it's a great Mishnah just to know, because again, it's very appropriate for the times. The Mishnah Ta'anit, Perek Dalet Mishnah Vav, Hamisha Devarim Ir'u Et Avotenu B'Shiv'a Asar B'Tamuz. There were five things that happened on the 17th day of Tammuz. That was the last fast. What are the things? It's going to tell us in a moment. But that's what it says, V'chamisha v'tisha be'av. And also five things on Tisha be'av. What were the ones on Shiva Asar v'tammuz? Nishtaberu haluchot. The luchot, the tablets, were broken. Butal ha-tamid. What does butal ha-tamid mean? We stopped bringing the sacrifices... The daily sacrifices, which of that there were two. There was the Tamid Shel Shahar and the Tamid Shel Ben Arbaim. The one in the morning and the one in the afternoon, Mincha. That's why some students still fight with me. Why do we have to pray Arbit? You still have to pray Arbit. We're not going to get into that Gemara. But we have two sacrifices. That was the day that it stopped. We had no more animals left. After that, the Huv Ha'ir which means the city walls were broken down. Apostemus, he burned the Torah. And, a, and an image, an idol, was placed inside the Aron. Inside, some people say that it was the Kodesh HaKodashim. Some people said it was actually into the Aron itself. But bottom line is, imagine the holiest place in the Mikdash having now a Pesel. That's what happened on Shiva Asar B'Tabuz. That was the last fast. Here, Tisha Be'av, we see the new five things. Now, for our purposes, we're going to only need the first one, but we're going to read all five. But Tisha Be'av, Nigzar al Avotenu Shelo Yikansu La'aretz. There was a decree on our forefathers to not be allowed to enter the land. You will not be entering Eretz Yisrael. This is the decree of the Miraglim. After the bad report comes and after Moshe rips his clothing, we say, look, Hashem tells us, look, that generation is not going in. The generation will not make it into Eretz Yisrael. Now we saw in the Pesukim there was no mention of Tish Be'av at all. And that's what we're going to strive to connect the dots. But the Mishnah gives that to you. As that is one of the things that happened. Let's do the other four. The first Beit HaMikdash and the second Beit HaMikdash both destroyed. Nilkeda Betar. Right, we saw Betar. What's Nilkeda? Nilkeda means it was not ensnared or captured. It was the last stronghold of Bnei Israel at that time, during the times of Rabbi Akiva and Bar Kokhba. And the city of Yerushalayim was totally desolated. Neharsha is the word that, is, that was used for the field. It was plowed. Something that's plowed, it's like you made it into a parking lot. And then the Mishnah closes with a clause. As soon as Av enters the picture, as soon as the month starts, we know that now it is a time of decreased happiness. Okay. So this is the Mishnah. Now what are our questions? Well, first of all, how come the Mishnah is not using the actual event as we know it in its quote when it's teaching us the five things? Why doesn't it say, Chayet HaMera Gelim? It says, no, the day that it was Nigzar Aleno that we're not allowed to go into the land. Mention the spies. Question one. Question two, is there any significance for after these five things being mentioned that we have a closing clause, Mishanich Nas Avim Ma'atim B'Simcha? Going to get to that in the next source. So let's just summarize up until this point so that we don't lose track, because we have a couple of things going on. The first 
thing that we have going on is in the regular story of the Miraglim. The story of the spies, we have two versions. We went over the differences, which we'll come back to, but bottom line is we see one version has Moshe acknowledging that it was maybe his idea. We have the people coming to Moshe saying, this is what we want, and we have no differentiation between any of the ten spies versus the two. And in the original story that we have, there's a clear difference, ten and two. Hashem tells Moshe, and Moshe is crying and ripping his clothing. So we have two different stories of the Miragelim. We don't have a date for when this happens. When's the first time we see it? The Mishnah that we just mentioned. But how does the Mishnah mention it? It doesn't give us a date. It gives us just, okay, this is what happened. It gives us the totsa'a, the result. The result is that we had this gezerah. A gezerah is a special decree. This decree that no one's coming into the land. So if we have that, that no one's going into the land, why did the, why did the rabbis just say, oh, this was the day of Chet HaMeragelim. And now we're going to try to connect the dots and see what the rabbis were trying to teach us. Let's go to the Gemara that's on this Mishnah, on source number five. Okay, so if we look at the Gemara, this is a Gemara Masechet Ta'anit. We have the English on the left-hand side. The Gemara starts off by trying to, and it's almost, it's a, it's a gymnastics event, trying to jump through hoops, to try and reconcile having the day of the Miraglim fall out exactly on Tisha Be'av. And it starts as follows. V'tanya, sivan shalach Moshe Miraglim. And it was taught, I'll read along with you in the English, on the 29th of Sivan, Moshe sent the Miraglim. How do we know that? Uchtiv, and it is said, right, Vayashuvu mitur ha'aretz miketz arba'im yom. So the Gemara says, and this is again, I saved you about two pages worth of Gemara. It says, we come to the fact that it was on the 29th day of Sivan that Moshe sent the Miraglim. 29th day of Sivan, now add 40 days. If I add 40 days, what day does that fall out to? It falls out to Tisha Be'av exactly. But that's a problem. We don't want the day to actually be Tisha Be'av because as we read in the Pasuk, whatever happened that day, that night, B'nai Israel started crying. So if I have an event that happens on the 9th and then that night they were crying, what day were they crying on? They were crying on the 10th. So the Gemara picks up on that. The Gemara says, Hane arba'im yom this 40-day period, if you're going to say that based on all of our calculations, which there are many, there are about five or six proofs and disproofs that try to get to that day, that even on the 29th day of Sivan is when they were sent. If you have those 40 days, you're one day too much. We really want the Meraglim to come back and bring their report on the eighth day of Av. And then B'nai Israel, they start crying on the night of the eighth, which is what? The ninth, which is Tisha B'Av. Because we all know Vahir Vahir Boker, at night, that's when the calendar flips for us. So the Gemara picks up and says, no, you're doing it wrong. Forty days after the 29th, we're still not there. Ah, so you're one day too far. So what do they do to get a day closer? So the Gemara has an answer. Amar Abaye. Abaye says, Tamuz dehahishata miluye miluya. says, no, Tamuz of that year, Nisan Yar Sivan, Tamuz of, Tamuz was full. What does full mean? How many months, how many days in a, in a Jewish month? 
There are, tw there are 29 days. 29 days in a Jewish month. Well, we need to make the month into a full month, quote unquote. How many, what do we do? We add a day. We add a day to make it day 30. So he says, Abaye says, I have the answer. Your math of adding 29 and then going 40, of making it be that that was the day of the 9th. No, really put 30 days into Tammuz. And when I put 30 days into Tammuz, then I get the count. When did the Miraglim come and bring their report? The 8th. And then when were they crying? That night. That night is which day? It's Tisha B'Av. The ninth day of Av. Let's read it back in the Gemara. It says, Dichtiv, where do they get that from? Kera alai mo'ed lishbor v'churai. We just read that today in Echa. Call this a mo'ed. Call this a holiday. What does it mean, call it a mo'ed? Mo'ed is also the same word, that's using a play on word. Mo'ed is also a time for calling the Rosh Chodesh and setting up the calendar, whether to add a day, take, a, take away a day. So this line in Echa of adding the day is referenced by Mo'ed. So we see that it's in Echa. They called it a Mo'ed. Not focusing on Tisha B'Av right now, but the rabbis set it up in that year. Was, that's what happened. That Look, the Mo'ed of Tammuz was, it was an added day. Which Mo'ed are we talking about? Not only the Mo'ed of Tisha B'Av, we're also talking about the month of Tammuz in that year. I know I see a lot of faces, it's a, lot, it's a stretch, but the Gemara is still, that's part of the point. What do we see? The Gemara is trying to stretch it to land the Chet HaMeraglim on Tisha B'Av. Taking Pesukim, twisting it, saying it's not really talking about this Moed, it's talking about Tammuz in the Midbar. Seems very far. Now when you finish the Gemara, we see the point. It says, Which we just saw. He said, and that night was when B'nai Israel raised their voices in crying out. The famous line, Amar Rabba, Amar Rabbi Yohanan, Rabba said in the name of Rabbi Yohanan, Oto hayom erev tisha be'av haya. This is the first time we see it. With Rabba in the name of Rabbi Yohanan. The first time we see that Tisha B'Av was falling out as the same day as the Miragilim. That that was the day. He says, Amar B'Yohanan, Tisha B'Av, Amar Lahem HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Atem Bechitem Bechiyah Shel Chinam, You sat and you cried for no reason. V'ani Kovei Alechem Bechiyah Ledorot. So therefore I will now make this night a night of crying for you forever. Very puzzling. When we read what Rabbi Yohanan says, it seems like because it happened on Tisha B'Av, then that day became almost like a day of bad luck, a day where every, the stars are aligned, that everything, just, everything bad just happens to us on that day. But where do we get that from? If it was so important that that was the day, so say, okay, they cried on Tisha B'Av. Say that day was Tisha B'Av. Say it in the Pasuk. You know how to give us other dates. We know. When was the Mishkan erected? Rosh Chodesh. Right, Nisa, we have that. Hukamah, Hukamah, Mishkan. That was the festival. And then the Nisim bring for 10 days. We, see, we know very important dates. So tell us. What are the rabbis trying to teach us by stretching two dapim of Gemara, esoteric little derashot, to try and fit Tisha B'Av together with the Meragelim. So really to get our answer, we have to do a little more work. We started off the class with working out the two stories of the spies. Now we have to focus and shift our attention a little bit. Don't worry, we didn't do this on the source sheet. But we have to shift our attention to the actual decree. What was the decree? Let's remind ourselves. The decree was that the, for 40 years, really not 40, we said it was in year two, for 38 more years, B'nai Israel would have to journey in the desert and 
they would essentially, they would have to die out. The generation, again, machloket, was it everybody? Was it only the people from ages 20 to 60? Only the males? Be that as it may, most of the people, about 80% of the people, according to almost every shita, if they were present for the Chet Meraglim, they were not going to enter Eretz Yisrael. Now, let's pose the question. If now we're sitting in the Midbar, and now we have to wait for people, wait 38 years in order to enter the land, what would be your strategy? I would stay in one place, stay, set up a camp, let's learn from each other, let's not waste our time traveling from one place to the next. Let's stay in one place. We can educate, we could still keep the land in our sights. We don't need more calamities happening, more complaining for water, more uh, uh, venturing off from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Stay in one place and let's wait for these people to die out. Instead, what happens? We take, if you could picture like a map of Israel, we go all the way down south, we come back up and around, and we circumvent a very important piece of land, which is going to start to give us our answer to what the connection is between the Meraglim and Tisha B'Av. And Moshe mentions this piece of land seven times total in the Torah, and the two times they recount the story, and it's a repeated story in Devarim. Moshe Rabbeinu says, you're not allowed, and he's relaying the prophecy of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that you're not allowed to start up or fight with which two nations? Ammon and Moab. Ammon and Moab, their land, you're not allowed to pass through. You have to go around. And not only do you have to go around, I don't want to see you asking them for anything, that's it, we're done with them. Ammon and Moab, if we can remember, we put on our Hidon Tanakh, caps, how were Ammon and Moab created? Yes, David. Lot, exactly. Right? So we have Lot. What happened with Lot? Lot, the daughters of Lot, they thought that at the end of the destruction of Sedom, that was the end of the world. So what do they do? They end up cohabitating with their father. They get him drunk. And they yield Ammon and Moab, play on words from that we, th these children came from the, our father. And that's how these nations come about. Hashem tells Moshe, He says, look, you're not allowed to touch these lands. You're not allowed to go through. You must go around. Okay. Why that's important? We're going to see right now. But why Moshe has to reiterate that is also a message. Ammon and Moab end up becoming the exact opposite of our entrance point to Eretz Israel. Now let's leave Moab and Ammon for a second. Let's talk about a tale of two very similar cities. I'll mention this, the character traits, and you guys identify the cities. You have a couple of people who walk into a city to sort of scout out the land. And they end up in the home of somebody with a very shady sexual pest and the people try and save this couple of people. The city ends up being destroyed by things falling down and the only people who are rescued from the calamity of the city are the people who offered refuge to these two people. So what city are we talking about now? Yericho. What's the second city? Tale of two cities. What story has this exact Sedom? Sedom and Yericho 
are introduced in the same exact way. People coming, they're being hidden, the city is doomed, and only the people who are righteous end up being saved. Sedom, who is the character? The character is Lot. Lot is the one who, albeit we can discuss whether or not all of his actions on that night were positive, he's the one who gets saved and saves the people. And Lot's legacy is Sedom. And yet Yeriho also has the same exact fate, quote-unquote. What's the connection? We're going to see that now in Devarim. Let's take a look at source 6. In source 6, we see something amazing that's going to bring us back to the two stories of the Miraglim. And right now we have Lot just dangling there. Everybody saying, why did the rabbi just bring up Lot? But when we come back, you're going to see how that's going to make everything tie and fit together in a neat bow. When Bnei Israel is sitting at the banks of being finally a free nation in their own land, the Torah describes the characteristics of what's going to make Israel special. And look at page 5, so on the top, Ulma'an tarikhu yamim al hadama asher nishba' Adonai la'abotechem latet lehem uzar'am eret zavat halav udvash. I want to make sure that I give you, I want to fulfill the promise giving you eret zavat halav udvash. Ki ha'aretz asher ata bashama lirishta, the land that you're going into to now inherit, lo ke'eretz mitzrayim hi. It's not like mitzrayim. It's not like Egypt. How so? Asher yitzatem isham, asher tizra et zaraqa, vishkita v'raglecha kigan hayarak. It's not like Egypt. Look at the English. There the grain you sowed had to be watered by your own labors, like a vegetable garden. Ve'aretz asher atem overim shama lirishta eretz harim of kaot. It's not, doesn't have the Nile River like Egypt does. It's mountainous. It's hilly. And what's going to need to happen? You're going to have to bank on the rain. Limtar hashamayim tishtemayim. And from the rain of the heavens, that's what, it's go that's what you're going to drink. Eretz asher Adonai Elohecha doresh ota tamid. Aine Adonai Elohecha ba mereshit hashana v'ad acharit hashana. It's a land where HaKadosh Baruch Hu and you are going to constantly be linked. You're going to need to beg Hashem for the rain. That's a tremendous difference. The Nile is always there. It rises, it lowers just a bit, perfect amount to end up getting everybody's field what they need. And you don't only fill the Nile from just rain. There are oceans, rivers, streams, so many other sources. But Eretz Israel is going to come only with the rain. So now we're introduced to Egypt. Now we're introduced to say, you know why you want this land? Because it's nothing like Egypt. If we go back to the Meraglim, the greatest sin was not the report that they gave, not if it was 10 versus 2 people, but go back to source 1. If you look at it, sorry, source 2. I bolded it for you on the bottom. The last line of source 2. What happens? They always were grumblings, amongst Bnei Israel, whatever it was, whether it was complaining about meat, whether it was complaining 
that they didn't have the man. There was always a threat. What do they always say? Oh, we should go back to Mitzrayim. Let's go back. It was better for us over there. So the pasuk before the bowl did says, It's better. Why should we get killed? Better to go back to Mitzrayim. The next pasuk is the kicker. Fine, it was just an idea. Sometimes you have a fleeting thought. You know what? Maybe sometimes a person switches schools, switches businesses, moves to a different area. So a person says, you know what? That first time something gets tough, what do you say? You know what? Should have stayed over there. Maybe I shouldn't have switched out of this company. Maybe I shouldn't have switched homes. But very rarely does that moment become and turn into a plot to actually have an exit strategy. By the Miraglim, okay, we just mentioned Mitzrayim. What's the next pasuk? Vayomru ish el they started talking to each other. What do they say? Nitena rosh. So I don't like this English translation that it has over here. Not let's go ahead to Mitzrayim. Nitena rosh, it means... Turn to Egypt. Let's get everybody and say, that's it, it's time to go back. That's what gets Moshe crazy. That's why we get the punishment. That's what's so terrible. But what does this have to do with Tisha B'Av? So we're going to connect all three of these stories. We have the Miraglim mentioning Mitzrayim. We have Moshe Rabbeinu right before we're trying to enter the land saying, you cannot go through Ammon and Moab. And then we have the tale of two cities, Sedom and Yericho. It starts with Lot. Lot, if we turn to the final source, in Bereshit, source Zayin, Lot, his shepherds and Abraham's shepherds, they get into a fight. They're arguing. What does Lot see? Velo nasa otam ha'aretz l'shevet yachtav. He first sees that this land cannot inhabit everybody. It can't, there's not room for me and there's not room for you as well. So what has to happen? First of all, let's back up one step. Why can't they fit all of their belongings in one place? Because they got too rich. Where did they just come from? Mitzrayim. Which we mentioned, skip to the next pasuk. Let's not fight, we're brothers. So two things here. What is the general translation of this? You go right, I go left. I love this English translation because it's more appropriate. It's not left and right in the Tanakh. When you see Semol versus Yamin, what direction are you always facing in the Tanakh? East. You're always facing east. So if I'm facing east, what directions are to my right and to my left? 
north and south. And what's happening is that they're looking down and they're seeing two places. What's in the south? That's Mitzrayim. What's in the north? What will become later on Yerushalayim, but the hillier regions. So Abraham is saying, saying, look, you pick. You want to go south or do you want to go north? This is sort of a trick question. Where do we see another one of these trick questions where, oh, you can either stick with me or go your own way. Where do we see it? Ruth. What's the right answer? Stay together. The right answer is not, I picked, the, is it to pick here or to pick there? You're really supposed to make no choice and say, Abraham, we'll work it out. Now, not only does Lot have a misstep and now he picks a direction, which direction does he pick? He picks the south. Let's read it. And he picks up his eyes and he sees, wow, I see the lush greenery of the Yarden. What did it remind Lot of? It reminded Lot of Sedom. And if we keep reading, it said... At the end, Ke'eretz, what does Sedom remind him of? Ke'eretz Mitzrayim. It reminds him of Mitzrayim. What is on Lot's brain? And we need to connect things in the text. When we stand at the end ready to inherit the land, what does Hashem tell us is great about Eretz Yisrael? That it's not Mitzrayim. How is it not Mitzrayim? You're going to have to rely on me day in and day out. You're not going to have a Nile River. It's that Nile River that excites who? It excites Lot. Now he's standing with Abraham at the first point of where things are going tough, getting tough. What's Lot's response? Lot's response is, I'm out. I'm, I'm, I'm checking out. I don't want this. I want Mitzrayim. I want Mitzrayim where it's easy. I don't want to work hard. I don't want to reach out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu on a day-to-day -day basis. I love Mitzrayim. And he chooses it. And when he chooses and he looks down at Sedom, who reminds him of Mitzrayim, what happens to Sedom? It gets destroyed. The, the progeny of Lot is who? Amon and Moab. After B'nai Israel sinned with the Meragelim, we'll go now in chronological order. Story one with Lot. Story two. Hashem tells Moshe, after the sin of the Meragelim, this is how you sinned. Leave these lands of Ammon and Moab. You cannot go through. You cannot even ask them for water, for drink, for anything. Why? Because it's Lot, it's the... Progeny and the sechut of Lot. Why do I care about Lot now? Moshe Rabbeinu is mentioning Lot. He's mentioning that you can't go through Ammon and Moab. You're making us go 38 years around. Let us sit and wait. He says no. Once you cried on that night for no reason, not for no reason at all. It doesn't mean that you guys cried because there wasn't a reason to. Of course there was a reason to. You started to get scared. But because of your choice, what was your choice? You said that you were going to now overthrow Moshe and have a real exit strategy to leave where? To Mitzrayim? That's it. You've now lost your right to now overcome and be the heirs to what happened because of Lot. You're just like him. You couldn't overcome the same thing that Lot couldn't overcome. Lot had a chance. He was standing arm in arm with Abraham Avinu. Who knows where his history could have, what it, what it could have became. But instead he opted, I'm out. This is getting too difficult. I'm going to have to work. I'm going to be challenged. 
challenged to the point where I'm going to need to look to God, I'm going back to Mitzrayim. And he chose that. Generations later, what choice did B'nai Israel make? They made that same choice. The sin of the Miragelim in the classical context is you talked Lashon Hara about Eretz Yisrael, you didn't listen to Moshe, right? In the first story we said, no, it wasn't really his call, he was crying. It was a fight amongst the Nisi'im, the 10 verses 2. When we look at it through this lens, what was the real sin of the spies? It's that they wanted to, the nation wanted to go back to Mitzrayim. They took the journey and they said, now is the time. Get a new Rosh. Let's go back. It was a threat up until this point. No, once they saw the Miracle, they said, it's not a threat. We're actually turning back and going. Hashem said, that's your reaction? After the Makot, after splitting the sea, after forgiving you at Chaita Egel, after what happened at Mara. After all these events, man, your reaction to me is you're going back to Mitzrayim. I'm going to make sure that exile and a lack of being able to rise to the challenge becomes etched into your history. And now it becomes the definition of the day. The rabbis, when they're going through the intellectual hoops, okay, 29th of Sivan plus 40 days, you're not going to remember that, and that's not the point. The rabbis were trying to share a message. What was the message? The message is that the Miraglim represent a failure to rise to the challenge. The challenge of exile is to say, you know what? I need Hashem. Our eyes always need to be looking up for the rain, not down. And look what I have, look what I created, look at this Nile River. When the Miraglim failed to do that, they erased what our forefathers did. When was the first time that we started to have that remedy? Yericho. How come Yericho is not the first glorious settlement? How come we don't have to settle that? We're not even allowed to touch any of the remnants, any of the rechush, any of the spoils. Yericho has to be left intact, but we raise the entire city. Because Hashem was trying to tell us, you want to now merit after these 40 years? 38 since the Miraglim, this is going to be your first test. Yericho is not a physical battle. It's not a physical conquest. Yericho was supposed to symbolize a self-conquest. Conquering your own Yetzir, conquering your own fear. You were afraid to come into the land? You didn't think we could do it? You wanted to run back to Mitzrayim? I want you to stare at this place where you send spies, where you're scared. And I'm going to give you a miraculous victory. No one had to lift a finger to make the walls of Yericho come down. The shofar blasts and the Aaron handled that. And no one was able to touch it, settle it, or lest there be a terrible curse on them. Because Yericho was supposed to be, oh, if you're able to understand it, that it's not with military might. It's with the Aaron. It's with commitment. It's with the Shofar. Only then can you now begin to end up in all of Eretz Israel. And if you follow the trajectory of history, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. Whenever we try and say, oh, it's kohi ve'otzi emyadi, asali et ha'chayel azot, right? When that happens, when a person says, it's all about me, and it's not Hashem, that's when we lose our way. Mitzrayim versus 
Eretz Yisrael is the sin of the Miraglim and why the rabbis were trying to stress you. You know why that's the day? Because that's when every, that's the day, the moment when everything turned. That's the moment when Bnei Israel had to be stuck now in a galut, in an exile, which can always come back to haunt them. We're constantly going to be tested. It's not going to be, okay, here's the temple, here's Yerushalayim, now go. It's always going to be a test to see if our eyes are going to be up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Just to close with a very famous parable that was told by the Or HaChaim HaKadosh and it was used to describe how there was actually a punishment for the Nahash, the serpent, in Bereshit. If you look at man's punishment, what's man's punishment in Bereshit? That's it, he's going to have to work hard. You're going to have to work hard your entire life. What's the woman's punishment? Sa'ad gidu banim and childbirth, pangs of labor. What's the punishment of the serpent? That he's going to go on his belly and he's going to eat dirt. Why is that a punishment? That's not a punishment. That's a reward. Is it difficult to find dirt? No. Now basically Hashem said, I'm stamping your meal ticket. You can go wherever you want. And you're going to have parnasa. You're going to be able to eat on any land. Is there any such land where there's no dirt? So how is this a punishment? So the Rahim HaKadosh, he comes and he gives a, gives a, a beautiful mashal. And he says that there was a king extremely wealthy, with two sons. One son was really a deadbeat. Not a good thing about him, lazy. Was definitely not the heir to the throne. And another son was the clear heir apparent. Nice, diligent, midot, smart, innovative. And he was the one who was going to get the keys to the kingdom. And yet when it came time for the boys to be of age, their 21st birthday. What happened? These two twins had totally different life paths. The king called in the son that was the degenerate and said, here you go. Here's this property. Here's all the guards, all the money, all the food, everything that you'll need. Now the son who's diligent is coming in saying, I wonder what mine is going to be. Okay, he gave him a modest house, guards, and enough money to last for a month. Now each month, that son had to keep coming back. Coming back to his father. Okay, dad, look, I need more money to pay the guards. I need more food. I need everything. Six months into the arrangement, that son says, dad, look, I don't get it. Everybody will agree that our brother, my brother, is not going to become the next king. He's not winning any Nobel Prizes. But me, I'm working hard. I'm your next in line. So to him, you set him up for life. To me, you're making me beg for money every month. And the king said, he said, that's exactly the point. He says, between you and I, if I ever see your brother again, it'll be too soon. I don't want him. But you, I love. So even if you don't come back to come and see me every single day, at least I know that every month I'll be seeing you. Same thing with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Did HaKadosh Baruch Hu care what happened to the Nachash? No. He was the one that, 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 that stirred the pot, that made, the, that made Adam and Chava have that first sin. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted nothing to do with the Nachash in the story. That's it. Take it. Take it. Don't speak to me. Don't ask me for anything. Don't come out. Stay in your hole. Stay where there's the dirt. But man, even though he may have done something wrong, man, Hashem loves. Man, Hashem loves. Man, Hashem always wants our relationship. He always wants us. But how does he want us? He wants us to rise to the challenge. 
Rabotai, we have so many challenges. What is Tisha B'Av about? Tisha B'Av is about putting those personal differences aside. How many times do we have to hear in the community, oh, you know, that shul, don't go to that shul. That school, don't go to that school. That guy, oh, better, better off if I never see that guy again. How many labels do we have? Black hat, white hat, pink hat, J-dub, Shami, Halabi. For so many of us, we can't see past these things. We can't see past these labels. And instead of facing them head on, what do we do? We run away from the challenge. We stay in our comfort zones. We don't branch out. We don't get ourselves to the next level where we're able to now create a society where HaKadosh Baruch Hu looks down and says, yeah, you know what? This society that the Jews have set up amongst themselves is a society that I want the non-Jews, the Goyim, to learn from. To be an Orla Goyim. Are we there yet? Well, we're still fasting. So the answer for this year was no. But the lesson of the Miraglim is to not always run back to Mitzrayim. When things get tough, there's always an easier road. There's always a place with less responsibility. There's always a place where it's more comfortable for you. And there's always a place where you can just ignore the growth. Growth is not comfortable. That's why they call it growing pains. When a person looks at themselves and they say, you know what's difficult to accomplish? It's difficult because it's not exactly you 100%. The gap between where you are and where you want to be, that gap is pain. And that gap and that space can be in any different time and pl uh, place in our lives. It could be a monetary gap where a person thinks, I really should be here, but I'm here. That's pain. It could be in Torah learning. I should know this, but I know this. How could I get there? That's pain. I should be able to treat this person in this way, but I really can't. I'm only here. How could I get to that level? That's pain. That space is something that's very hard to fill. Does HaKadosh Baruch Hu want all of us to fill the space? Absolutely. But more importantly, it's not about filling the space. It's about not running. We'll always have two choices. We'll, e we'll either be able to run back to Mitzrayim or we'll be able to go into Eretz Yisrael and rise to the challenge. If we run back to Mitzrayim, that's Lot. That's Sedom. That's not being able, that's wandering 40 years in the Midbar. That's going around Ammon and Moab. But if we rise to the challenge, that's Moshe. That's Yericho. And hopefully, Bezrat Hashem, that's going to be the next Bet HaMikdash. Yizkubin HaMatzion.